Doctor Who Scratch Man by Tom Baker Fear of Running Doctor, I have to ask, why all this activity? inquired the Zero Nun. There's some huffing. Fear of running. Agreement. Doctor. From the audience of Time Lords. You spent all your time running from things, running towards things, running here, there, and everywhere. Aren't you exhausted? There's a mucking laughter at that. Of course there was. Running? I'm running now. I did a few steps on the spot, just to show her. Running for my life, but so are you. Even sitting still, you're running. We're all running. All the time, just being alive is running. Even when we're standing still, every molecule in our bodies, creation is racing. So the physical act of running really is just joining in the fun of the universe. They did not like that. I staggered under the weight of their disapproval as a light burnt into me. I could hear them baying. If there was one cardinal rule the Time Lords lived by, it was never joining in with the rest of creation. Hear me out, I beg. You must think this isn't distraction. All a bit of fun, but it's important. I believe you, of course I do. The Zero Nun advanced, smiling with both her, th her teeth and neither of her eyes. But I worry that not all the audience is entirely persuaded. Oh, really? I said through clenched teeth, the grinding beam of light eased off just a little. I squinted out at my audience. A whole bag of humbugs tried to give their best impression of giving me the benefit of the doubt. Really, they were checking their watches and wondering when they could don their black caps. I'll tell you what you need to know about running. I told them I met quite a few emperors. They all the same, murder their way to the top of the heap, declare their, that they own the world. But then the next one of them looks at them themselves in the mirror. But then the next time one of them looks at themselves in the mirror, the reflection stares back at them. It says, really? You think you're safe now? That's when you're finally afraid. A tense hush. I've fallen over the room. I've made the most of it. I'll let you into a secret. They're really the ones who spend all their time running. From the mo moment on, they're running for their lives. And one thing you ne can never get away from is yourself. I let that sink in. Oh yes, where were we? Oh yes, running. Chapter 5 At church, Sarah and Harry stood in the porch watching the sunset. No one's come, said Harry. Sarah nibbled at her lip. Do you do you think it's just us left? You mean has everyone else been turned into a scarecrow or ground into food? You didn't have to spell it out, Sarah jabbed him in the ribs. Harry rather wished he still had his coat. The night was going to be a cold one. All he had to rely on was a blazer. Still Sarah did look very handsome in a duffel coat. Did you find any jumpers in those bags of old clothes? Why, asked Sarah, are you cold? Do you want your coat back? No, no, Harry politely lied twice. I just fancy seeing if there was a fisherman's jumper back there. Thought I might look dashing in one. There are some, said Sarah. They smell of mackerel. She took hold of his arm and steered him away. Tell you what, it's something we can do. I think you'll like it. Meanwhile, as I men as mentioned, I was still running. I ran through a field, mist had risen in the thick walls around me. Night on the island was terrible, starless murk. Even in the distant goals had fallen silent. The scarecrow on the bicycle pedalled indomitably to behind me, its smoking oil lamp the only relief against the gloom. Occasionally it would reach out to claw pluck out the nape of my neck. There's something about the creature that was primarily terrifying. It's something of the grave about it, like a half-decayed nightmare dug up and set 
on my heels. My feet betrayed me. I tumbled down a bank into a sand dune, torn by a goose. I staggered to my feet and stumbled through the sun sand. All was quiet. Had I shaken the thing off? Then came a dreadful clanging of chain and sulphurous light glowed in the mist. I ran on, swallowed my banks up by banks of fog. I was totally disoriented. Which way was the church, left or right? Which way was the sea? When well, do I only know when I got my feet wet? My eyes adjusted, decided that there was friendly, that it was definitely the sea in front of me. Was there something glinting beneath the surface? A rattling alerted me. A policeman was coming at me fast across the stone hard sand. I pricked the direction and ran, the full froth of the sea churning around my boots. If I could only, if I could just keep going along the shoreline, maybe I could reach a landmark or something. Then I heard it, drifting loud and clear in the evening air, a tolling of a church bell. Good old Sarah, I said. I struck off towards the sound. Up in the belfry, Sarah and Harry were tugging at the bell ropes, sending a peal after peal, echoing out across the countryside. Very loud, proclaimed Sarah. What? cried Harry. Sarah smiled at him fondly, and he nodded. It's very loud, he told her. He stepped back from the ropes, rubbing his arm. I don't know about you, he groaned, but I'm deaf and tired. Sarah nodded, massaging her ears. If that doesn't sound out the alarm, I don't know what will. She appeared out of the tower. Lights were dancing in the mist below. He's working, she said. They're coming. Sarah and Harry reached the porch. People busied, bustled towards them, led by a fierce woman in a horrid coat. The Miss Farrick of this world are always at front of every queue. Let us throw, she shouted, all puffed up for a fight. We demand admittance. Splendid, bleamed Harry. You must be our VIPs. Well, that's all right then, Mrs. Farrick deflated a little. I pushed him out of the way. She stood in the church and looked around. In dismiss it dismissively. Not put the tea oil on, have you? She sniffed. Come on, so for the de bar. Seems that we have to do everything. You may as well make yourself useful. She pushed a dowdy woman out of the crowd before she could protest. Fine to do this is, she snarled. Call yourself the authorities. Then she said, Well, as only the woman has spent decades scrubbing a doorstep can say, Well. Sarah turned to Harry. You're welcome, she whispered. Harry nudged her in the ribs. I'd run across the marsh, and the wet bulb gobbling at my feet. I wasn't quite sure if this was a brilliant tactical move or a terrible mistake, baiting my pursuer. But so often happens in the English countryside, things which appear very near prove, in fact, remarkably hard to get to. The marsh ended in a polarizing ditch, and a hedge woven from thorns. I withered through a small gap and plunged into a large field. Unlike the others, it has been planted ranks of corn, rising above my head, whispering and gossiping in the wind. Glancing up the feeble moon, I picked a direction and stuck to it, racing on through the stalks, a rustling on the staves are eerie. I couldn't shake off the feeling I was being followed, followed by something breathing down my neck. I couldn't resist the impulse to just turn and see what it was. It was a glance over my shoulder that saved my life. A blade jabbed through the air, snicking a chunk out of my coat. I turned to face the creature. It was dressed in a moth-eaten soldier's uniform, topped by a gas mask. It was holding an ancient rifle fitted with a wickedly sharp bayonet. I held up my hands, calling for a moment's peace. Wait, I told the scarecrow. You know, I can't stand the idea of being stabbed by a rusty blade. Another stab, I ducked back and held up my scarf, wading, wading the scarecrow off. Stay back, or I shall have to use this. Dropping the rifle, the scarecrow leapt forward. Two bony claws seized my face, cold ivory scraping across my cheeks, and rusty old nails digging into my flesh. I agonised and stepped up, stared up at the empty face of the scare creature, I yanked one end of my scarf. The other I had looped round the scarecrow's feet. The creature failed 
staggered and fell backwards. I was really away and running. And the natives are getting restless, Harry muttered. As well as a lot of questions about the threat they were facing, there had been a lot of fuss about the setting up of the tea urn. More fuss than Harry could have dreamt possible. A trestle table had to be found, set up, then a tablecloth, then cups. An old labourer had inquired, hopefully, about sugar. One very tired woman was asking if there's perhaps any milk. I bet Mrs. Noel had exactly the same problem catering the ark, agreed Sarah. She was watching Mrs. Farrack sweep some dry flowers into a bin as she laid out some drab plates and saucers. Amazing how people's faults turn from immediate danger to crockery. They went over to the porch and peered out into the gloom. Sarah shivered. Feel like you're being watched, asked Harry. Sarah nodded. Something's out there waiting. A young farmhand had approached, clapped literally in his hand. Excuse me, miss. You haven't seen the teaspoons, have you? Of course, I think Mrs. Farrack has them, Sarah said maliciously. She turned back to the porch. Harry was standing there, looking out at the mist, rolling through the churchyard. We'd better close up, he said. I don't like how it feels out there. Me neither, Harry. Sarah shivered. Hurry up, Doctor. Hurry up. Harry heaved the door shut. They were locking me out. At that moment, I reached the churchyard. There was, I thought, something so cheering about seeing a church lit up like that. Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve. Welcome, weary river traveller. As I crunched up to the path, four figures slipped out and out from the shadows to block my way. The scarecrows of the farmer's family. Oh, hello, I said sadly. Ordinarily, I felt fond of children. The children are partial to me. I'd just like to say how sorry I am that I got here too late to save you. Two of the scarecrow children flung themselves at me, sharp thorns of their fingers headed for my eyes. I dodged their attack and continued to run to the whole world, the church, but another of the unearthly creatures grabbed my leg. leg. I could feel the thorns scrape and stab into my shin, a grasp in pain. I kicked my leg out at the greystone, scrampering the nightmare child off on it. I broke into a limping run. A gasp told us heavy iron handled the door, church door, discovered to my horror that it wouldn't turn. I was trapped outside. Help! Harry and Sarah heard my cries, but found their way back to the door, blocked by Mrs. Farrack, her arms are folded. But that's the doctor, protested Harry. We've got to let him in. Mrs. Farrack shook her head. You said it had to be locked. And now it has to be unlocked, said Sarah. I turned to find the scarecrows fancy me into the porch. I wrenched the parish noticeable off the wall to use a makeshift shield. Really now, why can't we all get along? Scarecrow lunged at me. I swiped out with the board. Thin edge cleaved the creature's head. Its body. I watched it roll and topple and bounce along the gravel. I said, terribly sorry about that. Scarecrow knelt down, picked up its head, and put it back in place. And now I'm less sorry about that. I reached behind me, grabbing hold of Fredbear umbrella from a rack, shaking the umbrella as a sword and wielding the notice board. I backed up against the door and kicked it firmly. I say, I call, call behind me, sir, Harry. I could you see your way clear of letting me in? Scarecrow's got closer. The farmer's wife reached out for me, sharp sticks of her fingers bristling to caress my cheek. I fell back against the door and was amazed to feel it give way. Eventually, I reached out for something to steady myself and grabbed hold of the scarecrow's apron. I heard a tearing of old cloth as I fell back inside the church. Sarah and Harry were dragging me across the flagstones by the arms. By the arms yelling at each other to shut the door. As the door slammed shut, I saw something remarkable. I sprang my feet, shaking Sarah and Harry by the hands. Thank you both. Then I turned to the congregation, who was staring at me in alarm. Dearly beloved, good evening. I'm the doctor, and I realised tonight had been a bit of a shock. Yes, we really are under attack from our scarecrows. My back's in the news. I looked torn open and beamed. 
I know how to defeat them. Three scarecrow children stood outside the door, church door. More figures stumbled and shuffled into the churchyard and came, stood beside them. A row of blank turnip heads and sack faces staring bravely at the door. The smallest of children stepped forward and tapped at the door with its skeletal hand. Tap, tap, tap. When there were no answer, the next child joined in and they both knocked together. Tap, tap, tap. And then another scarecrow came forward. And not. And then another. And another. 